Chapter 6 The tomb was an old cistern, buried under the courtyard, closed by a grating at the foot of a damp, slippery stairway leading up to the iron door. There was no light down there, according to those who had been locked in, except around mid-afternoon, when a few rays of sunshine managed to filter through the holes and cracks caused by age and rust in the door to the courtyard. And there was virtually no air. You nearly suffocated down there. You can't breathe, said Salmon, who had experienced the tomb a few months before, because he had accidentally broken the blue and gold flowered glazed pitcher the mistress used when she brought us water in the morning. You feel yourself suffocating, and you think you're going to go mad. It feels like someone's grabbing your throat and squeezing. And then there's the dark. After a while, you begin to see strange shapes and colors, too, but they don't help you. They only scare you. I heard of someone who went crazy in the tome, and nobody recognized him. And then there are spiders, another boy said, a boy who came from the mountains and talked differently, this big, and he showed the palm of his hand. And scorpions, they're bad. They pinch and sting, and they're poisonous. And then there are snakes. There aren't any snakes, Salmon said scornfully. There's no water anymore. Yes, there are, answered the mountain boy. I saw them. You've never been in the tome, Simon silenced him. You'd better keep quiet. That night, we were all wide awake, despite our fatigue and hunger. The master had made us work an extra hour after sunset and hadn't given us any dinner. The foreign clients had come. They had barely noticed us. They had loaded their carpets into their vans and cars, and they had left. Probably Hussein Khan had done good business. Usually after the departure of foreigners, he celebrated with the mistress late into the night, and we could hear music playing from the radio. But it wasn't our music, the music we heard at fairs when the men gathered to sell their animals. The master played a strange, noisy music, and we couldn't understand the words of the songs. Foreign stuff, Kareem said knowingly. Music that comes from far away. But after this visit by the foreigners, the house was dark and silent, menacing. You'll all pay, Hussein had said before he went to bed. You'll pay for your friend. Because you were all in on it. I'm positive. Only a couple of the dim-witted and timorous children had tried to claim that they had no part in Iqbal's rebellion. But they had been pinched into silence. Who of us could be mad at Iqbal? We were all too worried. It's too hot, I said. How can he survive down there? It'll be like the brick kiln, said Salmon. Maybe worse. I can't remember anyone being put in the tomb in midsummer. Can you? Everybody shook their heads. The sun had been unforgiving that afternoon, and we were covered in sweat, even now that it was night, and we could feel our heads boil like in a fever. Please, just shut up. Just shut up, I wanted to scream. Maria and Ali shook with fear at my side. I saw someone come out of the tomb in summer, said Kareem in his deep, almost grown-up voice. Five days Hussein kept him in there. It happened many years ago. I was little then, but I can remember well. There was this boy, bigger than me. I don't know where he came from. One of his ears was missing, and he had a fierce look. He was like a wild dog, and we were afraid of him. What did he do? we asked. He refused to work, that's what. So Hussein whipped him. He whipped him good. You should have seen it. The boy didn't make a sound. And then? He kept on refusing to work, and when Hussein got near him with the whip again, ready to skin him alive, you know what he did? He bit into Hussein's arm and wouldn't let go. Kareem spat in the dust, just like a dog. So the master put him in the tomb? Five days he kept him there. And did he come out? Yeah, he came out. They carried him out like the dead, but he didn't die. He was all burned from the heat, and his skin had peeled away. He laid for a week on his pallet, and we put a wet rag on his face. 
Then he got up and began to work. Anyway, he was never the same. He was still like a dog, but like the kind that carries his tail between his legs. Iqbal won't be like that, I exclaimed. He'll give in too, said Kareem. What do you think? He's not so special. Probably he's defied all the masters he's had, and that's why they keep selling him, even though he's so skilled. But Hussein, he knows what to do with him. Iqbal won't give in, I repeated, and we have to help him. There were a few vague murmurs of agreement. Help him, muttered Kareem. So far, we've skipped dinner thanks to him. You can just shut up. You ate anyway, Salman answered back. I saved some bread. And I have some water, I said. Let's go. You're crazy, yelled Kareem. I forbid you. If the master finds out, he'll take it out on me. Shut up, Salman repeated. We slipped toward the door of the workshop, which Hussein Khan triple locked every night. A useless precaution in my opinion. After all, where could we go? He has the keys, said Salman, and he pointed to Kareem. Open it. Fast. Forget it. Let's do it this way. You open the door and you come along. If the master finds out, you can say we were trying to escape and that you were coming after to catch us. But if you don't help, I swear. It's true that Kareem was older, but he was thin and weak and had never been very brave. While Salman was as strong as an ox and feared by all, Kareem scratched his head, stood on one foot, then on the other, and looked around for moral support. Not finding any, he spat in the dirt angry and frustrated. He found the big iron keys deep in the folds of his trousers, sniffed a bit, acted the victim a little longer, and then opened the door. It was just past midnight when we found ourselves outside. It was a moonless night with a clean black sky because there are rarely clouds in the sky on a summer night. The air barely moved the leaves in the trees. We stood in the doorway for a minute, so our sweaty faces could dry. I wonder what it's like down there, I asked myself, and I shivered with fear. Stubborn little Ali followed us, and we crawled to the edge of the well. The master's house seemed dark and forbidding. We knew that Hussein Khan slept like an ox. Some nights his snoring sounded like a thunderstorm, but the mistress? She heard every sound. The slightest rustling, even, I bet, the wing beat of a night bird. We had often seen her in her bathrobe, wandering around in the dark, muttering fiercely as she pried into every corner of the courtyard. And what if they see us? From the edge of the well, two leaps would take us to the safety of Hussein's van. It smelled of gas and burnt oil. From there, however, the way to the iron door that led to the tomb offered no hiding places, but passed right below one of Hussein's bedroom windows. I was afraid it would be impossible to sneak by without waking the mistress. She was standing there, I was positive, hidden behind the curtains like a predatory animal, waiting for us to take just one step. For a second, I thought it would be better to go back, but then I felt ashamed. I turned to look at Salman. He was probably afraid too, but he knew he had to try first. After all, I was only a girl, right? And Ali was too little. He swallowed hard, then whispered, here I go. He began to crawl on his elbows and knees, holding the packet of bread in his teeth. He went slowly, his rear end pointed up to the sky, so that it seemed anyone could spot him slinking about. He continued to shift pebbles and seemed to be making such noise. And then suddenly he disappeared into the shadows. In the few moments of silence between one snore and another, we heard a couple of noises, then a short hiss. Go, I said to Ali. He ran as lightly as a kitten. He was gone in a second. Another hiss. Well, I said to myself, now it's your turn. I left cover. I had to crawl while holding the bottle of water, which threatened to spill at every movement. 
I kept telling myself that it wasn't really very far from the van to the rusty door, just a few meters. Sharp stones cut into my knees. It was dark as dark. Everything seemed so noisy. My dress rustling against the earth. My heart beats echoing in the night. My labored breathing. I was just under the bedroom window. I flattened my body to the ground as close as possible, just my right hand raised to hold the bottle. Would I ever reach Iqbal? If I was caught, I'd be put in the tomb, too, with the scorpions and the snakes. I was sure there were snakes, whatever Salman said. Finally, I bumped into Salman and Ali, who were sitting with their backs to the iron door. It took you long enough. Where's Kareem? We looked around. Kareem, we whispered, Kareem. We saw his tall, skinny figure emerged from the shadows like a ghost. He was dressed in white and was walking normally, slowly and calmly with his hands in his pockets. All we needed was to hear him whistle. He looked as though he were walking in the Sultan's gardens. You didn't really have to put on such a show, you know, he said. Get down, fool. The heavy iron door was hard to open quietly. Its hinges were all rusty and it was blocked by weeds. We tried to pull it open and it hardly budged. Pull harder, come on. It moved a few centimeters, then a palm's width, and then we could smell the damp, heavy stench of the tomb. Harder. The door turned on its hinges with a terrible squeak that seemed to cut the night in two. Quick! A light went on. We stood absolutely still, paralyzed like animals surprised by a hunter. I could feel my legs trembling, uncertain whether to stay or to flee. Run! A voice shouted in my head. Run! Salmon's hand blocked my arm. Don't move! He hissed. The bedroom window opened. A small square of light hit the courtyard. The mistress put her head out, looking first to one side, then to the other. She'd see us. She could not see us. I heard a noise, I tell you. I didn't dream it. It must be those damn children. We heard a faint grumble from inside the room. You? You wouldn't even hear a cannon. I'm going out to look, she said. Another grumble, this time longer and angrier. The mistress leaned out as far as possible and looked our way with her bleary eyes. We were there, only a few meters away, as visible as if we were in broad daylight, I swear, visible like fireflies on a bush. I could feel her eyes on me, but she didn't see us. She peered around some more, mumbled, closed the window with a bang, and turned out the light. We waited. We waited for what seemed to be an eternity. Eventually, my heartbeats slowed down, soothed by the sound of Hussein Khan's resumed snoring. We went down the steep, slippery steps in a single file. Our bodies were covered with perspiration. We had to move carefully as we tried to hold onto the slimy, mossy wall. We could hear the sound of metal beneath our feet. The metal ceiling of the tomb was right below us. We stopped near the grating. Iqbal, I called quietly. Iqbal. From his deep pockets, Kareem brought out a box of matches. We could see Iqbal in the flickering light of the match. He forced himself up from the corner where he was crouching and came toward us. His lips were split from thirst and the flame of the match bothered his eyes. The cistern that we called the tomb was wide, but so low that anyone standing could touch the grating with the tips of his fingers. I passed the small bottle through the bars to Iqbal. He drank avidly, then poured the rest over his poor face. His throat was too dry to let him talk to us, and although we had a million questions to ask him, we couldn't think of anything to say. The sight of him suffering moved and confused me, and I remembered that this was only his first day in the tomb. Salman was nervous. Kareem behaved as if he was just passing by and had nothing to do with anything. Ali pushed his hand through the bars and took Iqbal's hand. 
Hold on, he said. We're here now. Yes, I said. We'll come back every night. I have to admit you're pretty brave, said Salmon. The hell will return, said Kareem. I'm not about to risk anything. Thanks, friends, croaked Iqbal. His voice was like a thin wire. We went back every night.